Sean, you just moderated a session at the Development Finance Forum in Frankfurt that looked at behavior change communications experiences from the health sector and how they can be utilized for other sectors. It became clear that certain types of messages can be utilized for mass communications, while very complex situations and messages like in nutritional breastfeeding areas probably need instruments like personal counseling. Overall, to achieve great impact, it turned out that you will have to have a mix of tools. But how do you find the right kind of mix? In terms of social and behavior change communication, you know, investing up front to understand the issue. Uh, so understanding what is the point of view of the clients we're trying to reach, what are the constraints they're facing, where do they get their information? What do they see as the trusted sources of information? You really need to build from the bottom up to then understand how much do you put into media? How much do you put into interpersonal communications? Who in the interpersonal communications? Is it the health worker? Is it the agricultural extension agent? So to me, it's really about putting yourself in the shoes of the mom and the dad whom we're trying to reach, understanding their constraints, where do they get their information, and from that build a program that's actually addressing that. Within that, I think it's something that's extremely important, which didn't come out so much in the panel today, is that you actually reach through, there, particularly with nutrition, there's so many contact points. There's the contact point of the health worker, there's contact point of the agricultural extension agent, there's what somebody's hearing on television, on radio. That's all good, but you need to make sure those messages are coherent and coordinated so that we're preaching from the same hymn book. Otherwise, if you're getting discordant messages that the television saying one thing to you, but the health worker saying something else, it can be very frustrating for the mother. You're with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is very much into agriculture, obviously. I would assume that they also have a budget on behavior change communications. Do you think that donors, foundations should actually invest more in behavior change communications? And how do you see the interrelation with public relations? Because it seems quite often that the behavior change communications budgets are more used towards public relations efforts. That's an important point. I think there's a bit of fault on both sides because I do think there have been massive investments in social behavior change communication, but there's not been the evidence that they've been effective. There's been skepticism whether social and behavior change communication programs actually do lead to change. So there's a real need to have robust evaluations that are demonstrating how do the different pieces come together and what impact can you expect? What does it cost? And that's where one thing I'm proud with the foundation that we funded uh, a major program called Alive and Thrive that's really looked at proof of concept of scale up of promotion of breastfeeding and complementary feeding in three countries, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Vietnam, which has really demonstrated quite significant changes in exclusive breastfeeding over a relatively short period of time, about five years, and understanding the mix of interventions underneath that. But that's more of the rarity in the donor landscape. I do think there's underinvestment in social behavior change communication, but part of that underinvestment has been driven by programs that have not had robust data behind them. And you speak to donors, that's important, but I think it's also we need to not just make the case to donors, but make the case to high burden countries that these are investments that national governments should be making. On the panel now, there was a discussion about the power of regulations. What do you think? Wouldn't it be more powerful to talk to governments to invest in regulations to limit the impact of junk food companies and their campaigns? Wouldn't it be better to invest in that rather than trying to compete with those companies' campaigns? I don't think it's either or. So first of all, I think a big chunk of the communication you're trying to do is to promote positive behaviors. I don't think you can regulate positive behaviors. I do think there are parts of the regulatory environment, certainly around mandatory fortification, so mandatory salt iodization and mandatory fortification of key staples and condiments where it's essential and we certainly use our voice to help promote that. I do think also, as I mentioned, the appropriate marketing of breast milk substitutes in compliance with the international code. That's a regulatory framework that needs to be put into place by countries. 
in terms of the junk food issue, I don't think we actually have enough information right now to say what would be the appropriate regulatory framework. Part of that, of course, is addressed if you have national uh, translation of the international code, because what's happening, we're seeing some junk foods being used actually as complementary foods. So actually good code uh, compliance in countries would address that. The, the larger junk food issue, I think it's a bit premature to understand exactly what regulatory environment is going to work. You know, just to be frank, in the US, we don't have it right. I suspect we don't have it right in Germany. So for us to go and say that this is the right way to do it in Burkina Faso, I think might be a bit presumptuous. Thank you. Thank you.